Tonight's mailbag begins with the traditional pouring of the beer. And this time, it is Mount Joy Irish Dry Stout from Stone Angel Brewing in Winnipeg. They describe it as a traditional dark, roasty, and dry stout with notes of coffee and chocolate, very much in the Irish style. And yeah, they've chosen to name their beer after the ancient Mount Joy Brewery in Ireland. Some people have pointed out when I've had this beer before that there is in fact a Mount Joy prison, and there is, but this picture right here is of the Mount Joy Brewery. Right, that's enough about the beer. Get to the mail. This one calls itself Electronic Module, as all the best things are. Teeny tiny little module. What do we have? Bag and a bag and a bag. Hmm, that's an odd looking little module. Fairly dense, double sided board. Ah, that reminds me of what it is. The fact that it says ringtone there. This is a little telephony module. This guy, uh, being controlled by a microcontroller or something, will generate all the voltages and signals needed to simulate a telephone system that you can plug in a traditional telephone into and activate it and put it through its paces. This was brought to my attention by Gadget Reboot, and he's doing some projects with exactly that module over on his channel. I'll put a link up there to the most recent one. Um, I have a slightly different project in mind for what I'm doing, and I've got another part ordered to go with it. So when that gets here, then I'll start thinking about putting them together into an actual thing. AG1171 or AG1170 slick module, which is the form factor, compatible for KS0835F, not quite sure what that is, model for GSM network. No, it's not for GSM, it's for the old POTS lines, plain old telephone system phones. Uh, network, yeah, okay, 3 volts to 5 volts. Right, that is the operating voltage. I paid $6.53 for this thing, plus $2.84 shipping, so best part of $10, not quite, but close. So it takes a single input power supply between three and five and a half volts, has a DC to DC converter. The telephone line, a typical telephone line, the old school telephone lines run on 48 volts. If you still have a landline phone um, and you have the phone on hook, throw a voltmeter across the terminals, you'll get very close to 48 volts DC. Uh, so that's what that internal DC to DC converter is. Ring current function It's generating a ring voltage and current which is, if I remember correctly, about 90 volts AC at 50 hertz, 25 hertz. I don't know. I can't remember exactly. I'll have to look it up. Regardless, that's what's going on there. Positive or negative voltage function. Sure. Two slash four line conversion. So two wire is the typical old school phone line and it converts it to uh, four wire, which is two wires for transmit, two wires for receive. Constant current feed, yeah, that's what it feeds down the line. Uh, that's why when you pick the phone off hook, it the voltage drops way down, but the current in the line stays the same. Uh, designed specifically for GSM network. I'm not quite sure what they mean there, other than maybe a phone patch between GSM and a standard phone, or converting a GSM phone into a standard phone, something like that. Low price, high performance, sure, whatever. Uh, modem interface, IP voice interface, wireless access, sure, various different voice interfaces, that's what it does. Impedance characteristics, 600 ohms, yeah, that is the impedance of a standard telephone line. Four-way return loss, 24 dB. That's basically when you're converting your four-wire audio to two-wire, you're putting transmit and receive on the same pair of wires, you're going to get some crosstalk, but this thing has a uh, 24 dB of rejection in that. Uh, ring current voltage, typically 90 volts peak to peak. Yep. That's what it should be. And the line current 23 milliamps down that constant current phone line. Off to an interesting start. Let's see what's next. Now, this thing calls itself an LED bulb. That's not a surprising thing for me to be ordering. Oh, it's actually some of these little LED cobs. Okay. There is... Four, eight, there's 10 of them. All right. 
And these are, what do we got here? Five, six chip LEDs on an aluminum circuit board. Let's just grab one of these. I think I've got some similar ones, but these are good, uh, fairly bright little LEDs. And they are the same size as the little LEDs that I used in these things. So I think I can get even brighter than I was getting. So that I think is the project for these guys. Well, let me just light one up and see what I get. All right, got my power supply set to 12 volts. I'm currently limiting at about 80 milliamps. These things are probably in the 100, 150 milliamp range, but let's just start there. And yeah, that's on. It's not super bright. Well, I mean, it is really bright, but we're currently limited at 80 and it's only eight and a half volts. So let's crank up that current limit to 100 and 165 ish. Just barely warm. I'm still limiting it nine volts, basically. Let's see what 200 milliamps looks like properly bright and now it's starting to get warm and that is still current limiting right around nine volts so those are probably going to be a good upgrade for these little spotlight thingies just for playing around not for anything in particular but just cool to have 10 pieces of watt natural white three watt led bead high power cob led flashlight light bulb Huh, those would be interesting in a flashlight, I suppose. Um, I got these at auction for $2.64 for the 10 of them. Or, you know, $2 American if you prefer. 11 millimeters across, 3 watts, 9 to 30 volt input. Mm, no, I don't think they will survive 30 volt input. 360 degree beam angle. Yeah, no, it's not that either. Lifespan over 10,000 hours. Not if you're trying to dump 30 volts into them between 300 and 1,000 lumens. That's a pretty wide range. Color rendering index, I don't trust that either, but they call it 80. But since this was an auction, and the auction is done, I'm not going to link you to a closed auction, but I will link you to a similar one that I found, which has 15 of them in the package, 3 watts, same rough color temperature, for <laughs> basically the same thing that I paid for 10. Well, damn. Next thing calls itself light bulb. Yeah, okay. Well, the last one called itself lights, and it was. So this probably, maybe, is too. Ooh, in boxes. Hmm. The box has 118 millimeter cob, 110 to 140 volt warm white. Alrighty then. Oh. Oh, okay. These ones. Careful, don't touch that. All right. So these are to replace the halogen bulbs in a work light that I've got. The main reason that I got these is because the halogen lights are a little bit expensive. They're a little bit fragile and they're screamingly hot. They just cook you when you're working. So I thought when they die, I'll replace them with these guys. Dimmable R7 LED cob bulb, ceramic glass tube lights, 78 millimeters or 100. 18 millimeters, 6 watt, 12 watt, J type SS. J type is the uh, form factor, which is what we're looking for. I got the 28 watt, 118 millimeter. There's various other ones available. Warm white and 110 volt. You can also get 220 volts if you happen to be in those many countries. $9.95 is what I paid for each one of these, which is a little bit expensive, but it's much less expensive than the halogen bulbs. Depending on the wattage you get, it's either 400 or 799 lumens, 250 milliamps, as opposed to 250 watts of the ones that I had before. So here is the quartz work lights in question. And I'm just gonna quickly swap one of these in and then we'll check the power consumption on them compared to, between the new one and the old one. Okay, I'm going to point these both a little bit down so they don't completely blind the camera. Here is the original lamp. Nice and bright as you can see. And here is the new LED one. Hmm. 
similar brightness, sure. But this halogen one's already getting hot and this one is not at all. Right, next in we have strip white. Hmm, it's turning into a very illuminating sort of a mailbag. Oh, that is the kind of thing that uh, LED strips come in. And this one calls itself Cobb Strip 320 LEDs, 5 meters, 12 volts, 10 watts per meter. Natural white color. I've been starting to lean towards natural white, which is sort of somewhere between the bright white and the warm white. Just because it looks better to my eyes. And this one, compared to the normal LED strips you get, has the sort of phosphor diffuser kind of thing on it. You can still sort of see the individual LEDs through there, but I'm guessing that when you power it up, it's going to be much more diffuse and you won't be able to see the individual dots. So it'll look just like a strip. Not sure if it'll be quite as strip-like as those LED fake neon things that Big Clive's been playing with lately, but let's see. Let's make sure those aren't shorting each other out because that would be spectacular. And so with 12 volts on my power supply, and I'll currently limit it somewhere over one amp. That's probably enough. Boom. Strip of light. Now, I can still, when I'm looking directly at it, see the individual LED chips. And when you zoom in and adjust the, uh, the camera enough, you can see them too. But zoomed out at a reasonable distance here. You don't really see that all that much. And if you go even further at arm's length or something, it's, oh, you might see them, but in a, in a dark room or for effects lighting or something like that, I doubt that you'd notice. And just for reference at 12 volts, they're drawing three quarters of an amp. Flexible Cobb LED strip lights, 320 LEDs per meter, 12 volt, 24 volt tape light for bedroom cabinet. Or, you know, anywhere else you want it. Well, that could be pretty cool too for for lighting up uh, and marking the edge of cabinets or something like that. That'd be pretty neat. Anyway, I got five meters worth of the 12 volt version with 4,000 Kelvin natural white for 1099 American or 1449 Canadian. They've also got cool and warm white. We've also got 24 volt version and you can get it as a little as half a meter. Tape's eight millimeters wide. It's 10 watts, uh, 320 LEDs per meter. 10 watts is going to vary on, you know, the length that you've got, but um, there's the color temperatures approximately, CRI greater than 80, which, you know, it's not photo studio, but it's not really intended to be that either. Uh, operation over a wide range of temperatures as usual, 180 degree viewing angle. Yeah, with that uh, sort of diffuser phosphor kind of coating on it, it does spread it out. There is something to think about with all LED strips. There may be a voltage drop over the length of it because the traces over the length of it that act as bus bars are not the widest thing in the world. If you're using long distances, you might want to feed power in at both ends and maybe even in the middle just to reduce that voltage drop and reduce any brightness uh, inconsistencies. And the last thing, and as is tradition, the largest thing. This doesn't say what it is because, again, it came through the Canadian reshipping warehouse. So I don't know exactly what it is, but I got a pretty good idea because I don't think I've ordered anything else this big. Ooh, double bagged for your protection. This is a, ma a peelable, flexible, magnetic build plate for my 3d printer so it's two pieces basically this is a magnet yes it is a magnet with an adhesive backing on it that goes onto the platform of your printer and onto the not the build surface because right now the build surface is minus glass but there's an aluminum plate underneath it so that sticks down onto there and then this becomes your build plate and it is Oh, it's also magnetic. Okay. So they just stick to each other. And on the top here, it has very standard sort of rough, slightly rough textured coating um, for 3D printing on. And 
to release things that are stubborn to release, you just give it a flex and they snap right off rather than having to sort of chisel away with a scraper or something to get a stubborn print off the bed as you would have to on glass or whatnot and because my printer came with glass and quite honestly i don't have any problem with the glass surface but i uh i see so many people advocating for the magnetic beds that i decided to go and get the cheapest one i could find and that cheapest one happened to come from AliExpress. This is King Rune 3D Printer Heat Bed Sticker, Heat Paper Printed Hot Bed Surface Sticker for Ender 3, which is what I've got, Ender 3 V2, as a matter of fact. Uh, 3D Printer Platform Film Base. And these go for between 308 and 867, depending on which one you get. I got the two layers, which is the magnetic base and then the removable sheet. If you just get one layer, that is just a self-adhesive uh, build plate that goes straight onto the aluminum substrate of your uh, heater. So I wanted the removable one, and that's what I got. It cost me $8.76 plus $6.72 shipping. So, yeah, that's just the way of the world today. But And there is the contents of today's Mailbag Monday haul. A variety as always, although a big focus on illumination this time always fun stuff so um this telephone module is going to be a future project once some other stuff shows up and i do a bit of research upgrade for the 3d printer at least i hope it's an upgrade upgrade for my work lights so that i don't cook myself when i'm working in small rooms these are just for fun and tinkering with my little spotlight projects and this just seemed like a cool thing to have and i'm sure an application will present itself at some point in the future well, thank you for watching. I appreciate it. As those of you who got to the end here and a special thanks as always to my Patreon supporters and my YouTube channel members for helping to fund this madness and keep the mailbags rolling in. And of course, to keep my beer fridge full. And thanks to everybody else who watches every week. I do appreciate that. Questions and comments down in the comments section as usual. I'll talk to you later.